I welcome you as we enter into the presence of God this morning to worship Him. A few announcements as we begin. First of all, I want to welcome uh, those of you that were here yesterday or in Sunday school. Most of you should be aware, but we're very thankful to have Tim Hogan's wife uh, here with us this morning. Tim's been speaking on parenting in an upside-down world. Uh, yesterday, the sessions are all available on YouTube, uh, on our YouTube channel, um, ironically after the Sunday school session. But uh, <laughs> we uploaded those 400 minutes uh, or um, but those are there, the great benefits. Sunday School is also there uh, on technology and dating that we just looked at and would recommend that highly to you as well. And we look forward to another session now and then one more at 1 o'clock. We have a pitch-in lunch. If you weren't aware, please stay, eat. There's always plenty of food. would invite you to join us for that fellowship after the morning service. There will then be no 6 o'clock evening service tonight. We'll conclude with that 1 o'clock service this afternoon. Would uh, make you mindful to be praying for several things within our church body. Would ask that you would pray for Andrea. We've been praying. She's gotten that procedure for her kidney stones moved up. That'll take place on Tuesday. We'll be outpatient, but pray for her for that. And then uh, the Zetterbergs are home this evening. Ed's uh, down with COVID, and so pray for him uh, and uh, for Pam as they look to recover from that. So. The other things you've got upcoming, uh, August 30th, the Seniors Lunch, the sign-up went out for that, and would again remind you, uh, we are having a fall Bible conference that will take place on a Saturday and a Sunday in November, and uh, Pastor Mark Webb is coming to preach that on the life of Job, so if you can and schedule that out, set aside, you'll want to set aside the 5th and 6th of November uh, to try to be here for that uh, as Mark will come and lead that. We look forward to that. Our call to worship this morning is found in Joshua 24 and verse 15, and it says, And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your fathers served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I pray that all of us come and gather this morning and say that, that we will serve the Lord. Uh, that is uh, something that we should keep in mind as we order our homes. It's something we should keep in mind as we order our worship this morning. Uh, we don't serve worthless idols. We do not serve uh, gods who cannot lift their hands and cannot help and cannot meet with us. We serve the true and living God. And we come to worship him this morning. What a privilege. What a joy. But may we be mindful that we are entering into his presence. He is the living God. May he be praised. Please turn your grace hymnal to number 136. And let's stand together and sing, O oh, four thousand tongues to sing.
Please read it along with me, Psalm 116. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my pleas for mercy, because he has inclined his ear to me. Therefore, I will call on him as long as I live. The snares of death encompassed me. The pangs of Sheol laid hold on me. I suffered distress and anguish. Then I called on the name of the Lord. O Lord, I pray, deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Our God is merciful. The Lord preserves the simple. When I was brought low, he saved me. Return, O my soul, to your rest, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. For you have delivered my soul from death my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I believed, even when I spoke, I am greatly afflicted. I said in my alarm, all mankind are liars. What shall I render to the Lord for all of his benefits to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. O Lord, I am your servant. I am the servant. I am your servant, the son of your maidservant. You have loosed my bonds. I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people, in the courts of the house of the Lord, in your midst, O Jerusalem, praise the Lord. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we are reminded here, even in this very passage, that you hear our cries you inclined your ears to us. Father, we come to you this morning asking many things. And Father, we ask that we might uh, praise you and glorify you. We might serve you appropriately this day. What a privilege it is to call you Father, to know you in such an intimate way. And we know, Lord, that that has come about because of the work that you did in our hearts in calling us into yourself through the blood of Jesus Christ. And Father, we praise you for that opportunity today that we have to serve you, to praise you. And Father, we ask for your help, even as we meet here this morning, that you will be glorified, that we will be, thanks, that we will be thankful, Lord, and that we'll raise our voices to you in, in gratitude, Lord, for all that you've done for us. Even as the psalmist has praised you because you heard his cry, so you've prayed. we praise you again this morning, Lord, because of the answers to prayer you've given us. We thank you, Lord, for the small things that were answered this week, the large things in our estimation that you heard us cry out to. And Father, you were faithful to us. And because of that, Lord, we love you and we desire to serve you. Father, we pray for the, those who are ill and hurting in our own assembly here, and we praise particularly, Lord, for Andrea, as she enters into the surgery Tuesday, we pray that there will be no delays in this. We pray, Lord, that this procedure will help her, give her the comfort that she needs, and, and help her, Lord, through this very difficult situation. Lord, we pray for Ed as he's suffering with COVID and Pam with him there at the house. We pray that you'll encourage them in the midst of this, Lord, and that you'll heal their bodies. We pray for Steve Martin, Lord, as he's away from us, and preaching in another congregation, Bless his ministry there, Lord. May you be glorified. May the souls be encouraged, Lord. And may your word go forth freely. And Father, we thank you for what you've done for us this weekend. We thank you for the clear message from your word about parenting and all the things that your scripture addresses regarding that. You've not left us in this world alone. You've given us your Holy Spirit. You've given us the instruction from your word. Father, you've prepared us well for the things ahead of us. We ask, Lord, that we might take these things seriously, that we might pray for each other, that those of us whose kids are already out of the house might pray for those who 
are in the midst of it right now. And Father, we pray that we might encourage one another through your word and through the truth of your word to be faithful, Lord, in the task before us. Father, we thank you for your servant who's come to speak to us this day. We ask that you bless him in this hour. May, his, may the word from his mouth, Lord, be according to your word. And Father, may we be encouraged and blessed by that. May we be, at times, Lord, if we need to confess sin, may we be encouraged to do that as well and repent of our sin. But Father, we ask that you be the one who is preeminent in this hour. Thank you again for loving us the way you do. Thank you for being merciful to us this week. Thank you, Lord, for caring for us in ways that many of us probably won't even express other than in a prayer to you. But we praise you, Lord, and we love you. Be with us this day. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let us continue by singing number 346, The Christian Home.
Thank you, Linda. Well, it's the time for our pastoral prayer, and I want to pray for our homes, but I want to try to give Tim as much time as I can this morning, and so I'm just going to thank him and introduce him. But um, many of you are very well aware Tim is a longtime friend uh, to to me uh, and to our church body and many within. Before you get the wrong impression, I grew up with his sons, not Tim, so... um, (laughs) But uh, his son, Ben, is married to Kelsey, uh, used to be Maul. Uh, and then uh, his other son, Aaron Hoke, we often pray for at Grace Baptist in Warsaw. Uh, Tim and his wife uh, reared their two sons and now have how many grandchildren? Eleven. Eleven. Uh, and uh, Camilla was taught in the Christian school there as well. And Tim was the administrator of the Christian school. They have a lot of wealth of knowledge in, in regards to the home and the family, and uh, we just praise God for that, and thank you for your humility and your willingness to come and to share and to teach us, and uh, we just are very thankful to have him here with us today. But let me go before the Lord and pray for our homes and our families. Father, we've just sung a, a wonderful hymn that reminds us and really could be our prayer that you would give us homes that are built upon the Savior where Christ is head and counselor and guide. And we do, we pray that every child that is raised in those homes would come to know you, that they would see the worth and the worthiness of the Savior through the lives of the parents. Uh, Father, that you would help us as fathers and mothers, that we would be so dependent upon Christ, that we would be so changed by Christ in our own lives, that um, our children would know that we are who we are by the grace of God and because of Christ. That, Father, he really would be that counselor and guide that we would parent according to uh, not simply behavioral changes or manipulations or to have a perfect home, but to parent where Christ is honored So, Father, we confess there are times where we have not done what we should and we have not um, guided where we should. And, And, Father, help us to have the humility as parents to go and to confess our sin before you, that you would forgive us of that, to confess it to our children and and to set things right when need be. Give us that humility. I pray that you would help us as fathers within the home, that you would give godly fathers who are the head of their home, who lead their wives with love and tenderness, who lead their children, who are willing to say no when no needs to be said, who are an example that can be followed in their footsteps. Father, you'd help us to relate to our children, to see it as a not a distraction, but as a a calling. Father, we pray for the mothers that you would give them grace, that they would be giving themselves in a way that they would love their children, they would serve their children, that they would lead their children, that they would love their husbands. uh, Father, all of this as unto you for the worth and the worthiness of Jesus Christ. We pray for the the children that at a young age they might see that there is a way that they can please you in their honoring of their father and their mother. Father, we we heard this morning in Sunday school that we, we are facing many challenges. Our children face many challenges, the ease of which that they can be distracted or the ease of which they can enter into sin that you would keep them that they they would set before themselves the Lord that they would serve him and in all these ways father that our homes would be yours they are not ours for us to idolize We are given this opportunity and what a precious blessing to serve our Savior and our God. May our homes do so. 
Father, where, where there are those that have reared their children and there are still breaking hearts, uh, Father, that they long for their children to know you. We've heard the history, the stories of adult children who cannot get away from their mother's prayers and teaching their father's prayers and example. Father, may it be so. May they, they continue to pray and continue to hope in Christ. Continue to see their worth in serving you regardless. Regardless of the outcome, may we in our houses serve the Lord. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Before Pastor Hoke comes and brings the word to us, let us stand together and sing number 364 in your grace hymnals, How Firm a Foundation. Probably sat on it. <laughs> See the evils of technology. We were talking about that in Sunday school. Man. I want to thank your pastors for inviting me to come this weekend. It's been a delight. Uh, for us, we had a good day yesterday. And uh, how many of you guys were here yesterday? Thank you for coming back. <clears throat> I realize this is not your normal setup for Sunday morning worship service. You don't usually have PowerPoint pictures on the wall. You usually have your hymns on the wall, and because I got my stuff up here, you had to use hymn books. I'm sorry for that. <clears throat> um, and it's also... Um, it's okay. There we go. Because the body is diverse, there are lots of you that are well beyond the stage of rearing children, right? 
How many of you are empty nesters? Okay. We're glad you're here for this stuff on parenting. The body is diverse, and it's really good for the parents who are here to know that you, who are past that stage, are hearing what they've got to do. Because that will help fuel your prayers for these younger parents who are right in the trenches raising their children. That was good. <laughs> so it's really good that we've got a mixed crowd this morning. Even though what I'm going to say applies primarily to those who are in the throes of rearing children, it's good for all of us to hear that. And I hope you older folks like me will take this as an exhortation to pray and plead with God for those who are in the trenches of rearing their children these days. It's one thing to acknowledge theologically and intellectually that we're altogether helpless when it comes to everything, but if you want to take helplessness down off the shelf and feel it in the depths of your soul, have children, and you'll feel it. We could call this series, I think I said this the other day, Humility 101, and it's true, but it's just as true that God gives grace to the humble. Don't ever be upset that God has ways, all sorts of ways, to humble you, okay? Because who does God give grace to? The humble. I have a good friend out in California who always says, stay down low because grace flows downhill. God gives grace to the humble. So stay down there, okay? And, and grace comes, and it comes to parents when we're in that place of desperate need. And all of you parents. parents, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another, for God is opposed to proud, parents. but gives grace to the humble. But if any of you parents, parents lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all, parents. generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. We keep coming back again and again to the resources we have available, and those resources are rich, and they're many, and they're rooted in the grace of God. So find yourself all the time going back and back and back again to the grace of God for help to parent. So far, we've done a lot of material in the book of Proverbs, and there's a lot there to draw upon, but when we come to the New Testament, the texts on parenting are very few. There are images of parenting in the background here and there, Paul does that with both mothers and fathers in 1 Thessalonians when he says, We prove to be gentle among you as a nursing mother tenderly cares for her own children. And just as you know how we were exhorting and encouraging and imploring each one of you as a father would his own children. So those images of family life and parenting are there in the page of the New Testament, but the particular texts on parenting are few. The major New Testament text on parenting is the well-known passage in Ephesians chapter 6, the first four verses, which I'll not take time to read, but this morning our focus is going to be on verse 4. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. And the parallel passage in Colossians chapter 3, which says, do not exasperate your children. There are three things we want to look at at this text. Who is addressed? and that's fathers, what they must not do, provoke their children to anger, and what they must do, bring them up in the fear and admonition, in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. So let's tackle these three things this morning. Who is addressed here? And Paul is obviously talking to fathers. I don't think his intent here, we've, we've made reference to this uh, yesterday, I don't think his intent is to exclude mothers and say there's no way mothers can provoke their children to wrath. Shall we take a poll among the children? How many of your moms have driven you bananas? I'm, I, just every once in a while. Okay, it happens. So Paul is not excluding mothers from the whole scope of parenting responsibilities. Paul was too careful, an Old Testament scholar, not to know how often Proverbs addresses the place of mothers in parenting. But I do think Paul is pointedly speaking to fathers. He uses the general word for parents in verse 1, children obey your parents, mom and dad. 
Here he uses the this, this, use this specific word for fathers, and we can only speculate as to why his exhortation comes to fathers especially. Maybe because fathers are the heads of their homes and are responsible to see that this exhortation is carried out across the board. It may also be because it's the peculiar temptation, I think, of fathers to exasperate their children and to dishearten them. We are generally, I know there are exceptions, but dads are generally not as, not as tender and understanding and patient as our wives are with our children. So maybe it's because Paul observed that and he calls on fathers particularly. It may also be that under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Paul is addressing dads because dads more than moms in the majority of cases are the ones who bail out on their kids. In 1961, out of every 10 children under 18 lived without their father. In 2018, one out of every four children lived without their father. But you know, the sad part is that dads can bail out on the kids without ever leaving the home. They pour themselves into their work, their hobbies, their recreation themselves, but they don't always pour themselves into their children. So Paul is after fathers here especially. So I'm asking you dads, tune in and stay with me because Paul is talking to you. Okay? Moms, don't tune out. Okay, you stay with me too. But dads particularly pay attention. Now, Paul talks about what they must not do. And what he says is, do not provoke your children to anger, or in Colossians 3, do not exasperate your children that they may not lose heart. Those could be translated, stop provoking your children, or don't ever be provoking your children. Stop exasperating. Don't ever be exasperating your children that they may not lose heart or be discouraged or cast down. It's critically important that we understand what Paul is not saying here. He is not saying don't ever do anything that would make your children unhappy. Okay? That would cause your children to be upset with you or even to be angry. There will be any number of things you must say to your children that they are not going to like. No, you may not have another piece of candy. What kid likes to hear that from dad? No, you may not have another piece of candy. No, you may not go to that movie. Yes, you have to finish your vegetables before you may have dessert. No, you may not borrow the car tonight. Yes, you have to clean your room right now. Yes, you need to finish your homework first. Yes, you must let your sister go first. Right, 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 right. Did that dad just provoke their children to wrath or to anger because they required something hard of them and something that they didn't particularly like? Just because Susie throws a fit or Johnny stomps his foot or bursts into tears does not mean that you've provoked them to anger. It may simply mean you've crossed their wills and they don't like it. And you've got to stick to your guns. Remember Hebrews 12, 11. All this one for the moment seems not to be joyful but sorrowful, yet to those who've been trained by it afterwards it yields peace for the righteousness. There's going to be some sorrow sometimes when we're training our kids. Okay? That's not what Paul is talking about. Here in Ephesians 6, 4, there's more than just making your kids upset. The words in Ephesians 6 and Colossians 3 have to do with making resentful, provoking, irritating, making bitter, exasperating, losing heart. We should not be dealing with our children in ways that make them frustrated and cast down and dispirited and feeling like they can never satisfy mom or dad no matter what. And sometimes our kids think that. I will never, I will never make you happy. We've exasperated that if they come away with that kind of thought. All right, so how do you know if you're provoking your children to anger or if it's just their sinful response to your just and wise requirements? We'll look at some specifics in a moment, but broadly speaking, dads, we need to study carefully the pattern of God the Father as he deals with us, his children. Does he provoke us to anger? Does he provoke us to wrath? Does God exasperate us? 
Never. Do we always like what God calls us to do? No. Is what God calls us to do sometimes really difficult and challenging? Yes. Does it often cross our wills? Yes. But does God ever drive us to despair? I will never satisfy you no matter what I do. No, God doesn't do that. And yet he calls us to do some hard things. How is it that the hard things he calls us to do don't exasperate us or provoke us to wrath? I'm going to say it again. Remember the whole context of parenting that we talked about several times yesterday and already this morning in Sunday school? It's the what we call our children to do have to come in that whole context of parenting. And what God calls us to do comes in a context of unquestionable fatherly love. They come in a context of incarnational love, God becoming man in order to redeem us. They come in a context of intimate knowledge of, covenant commitment to, and gracious provision for us. Everything God asks us to do come in that context. And that's a whole different context than barking out orders. Get busy. That would exasperate anybody. But what God calls us to do, and the hard things come in this context, but so often, especially as dads, we can be uninvolved with our kids. We've been too busy to spend more than a few moments with them. We're too busy to tuck them in at night. That seems to be mom's job. It's not mom's job. Come on, dads. Tuck your kids in at night. Spend some precious moments with them. Sometimes we've been too busy to play with them in the leaves or too busy to take them to the park or too busy to sit down and listen to their fears. And sometimes we've been too busy to pray with them. So when we require something of them that is hard, it's almost like, it's almost like we're a stranger suddenly invading their personal space and barking out orders and they resent it. And we provoke them to anger. So the question is, how much like God the Father are we to our children? Think about it. Before your children have a clearly defined concept of God as Father in their minds, they will have a clearly defined concept of Father in their minds, and it will be the image that you have created for them. You with me? Kids will understand what a father is long before they have an understanding that God is the Father. And that image they have in their mind will be the image that you, dads, created for them by, your, by the way you father them. So when they learn that God is Father... That will either set well with them or it will cause them to struggle with God being described that way. It hangs on what kind of a father you have been to them. You are creating an image of fatherhood before they, oh, Jesus said to pray, our father. God is father? They will either be glad about that or they'll not be too happy about that. Depending on the image you've created for them of fatherhood. So now let's think about some specific ways in which we can provoke our children to wrath or to anger. Number one, don't expect more than your children can deliver. They're just kids. And they're at all different stages. You wouldn't expect a three-year-old to do what your 10-year-old is doing. And not all of your children have the same gifts and abilities and strengths and weaknesses. You must know them. You must know your children. Proverbs 27, 23 says, Know well the condition of your flocks. Know well the condition of your children. If I ask you dads right now, spur of the moment, to sit down and write a detailed paragraph on each of your children, outlining their personalities, their strengths, their weaknesses, and capacities, etc., could you do it in three minutes? Or would you have to struggle with that? I hope you could do it in three minutes. Don't expect more than your children to deliver. That means you've got to know them well. You've got to know them thoroughly. 
This is where we have to distinguish between their sinnerhood and their creaturehood. When you're teaching them, we talked about this yesterday, when you're teaching them how to use a fork and spoon, you don't berate them for missing their mouth. That's their creaturehood. But fling their food across the table in rebellion is their sinnerhood. And that's got to be corrected. If your child, listen, if your child is not blessed with natural athletic coordination, you don't give him a tongue lashing for missing the ball or falling down or not scoring a goal. That's their creaturehood. And not everybody's going to be an athlete, okay, Dad? I played soccer in college. And I loved, I still love the game of soccer. I love to go watch my grandkids play. But not all my grandkids play soccer because they're not all good at it. So do I love the ones who play soccer better than the ones who don't? I hope not. And do I look down my nose to the ones who go, what's wrong with you? Why can't you kick that? Oh, yeah, kick the ball. Come on. No, 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 no. They don't all have the same gifts and abilities. But if... If your son or your daughter argues with the referee and gets in his face, you discipline him for his disrespect to authority. You have one student, one child who's an A student, and one who's a B minus student, or maybe even a C student, and they're both putting out their best work. Not every kid, okay? Do I need to say this? Not every kid is cut out to be an A student. God didn't glue them all together that way. Right, Mrs. Martin? You teach school. Not everybody's going to come flat out of her class with A pluses. But they can come flat out of her class having done their best and they're a C average. So do you treat them differently because you got a full ride to college and your son or your daughter's struggling to keep a C average going? Do you treat them differently because they're just not up at this level? We can provoke them to wrath very quickly. There's a desperate need for balance here. We always want to encourage our children to excel and to do their best for the glory of God. And we need to stretch them and not set the bar too low, but that can very easily become an obsession to produce overachievers, which is so often little more than an ego boost for the parents. Don't try to live out your failed dreams in your children. You'll provoke them to wrath in a heartbeat. You've got to know your children and not expect more than they can deliver. Be careful how you correct, admonish, or rebuke your children. Listen to these words from Proverbs, death and life are in the power of the tongue. You all hear that? Death and, death and life, right here, are in the power of the tongue. A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. How we do it, the words we choose, and the volume and tone of our voices can make all the difference in the world with regard to provoking them to anger and exasperating our children. We ought never, we ought never, we ought never, you with me? We ought never to call our children derogatory names. You dummy, you clumsy ox, you miserable slob, you idiot, don't you know any better than that? Death and life are in the power of the tongue. You just, you just killed your kid. Harsh words only serve to stir up anger. Can't you do anything right? You'll never amount to anything. You make me sick. You better not mess up one more time or I've had it. You just provoked your child to wrath. We sometimes taught our children that we don't mean business until we resort to harsh language or a certain volume. Normal conversation is give or take around 60 decibels. But you know what we've taught our kids sometimes? We've taught our kids that disobedience is okay until we had about 100 decibels. We taught them. 
They've trained us that they don't have to obey until we get to shouting the roof off the house. We provoke our children to wrath with the tone and the volume of our speech to them. Sweetness of speech increases persuasiveness. There's not a word in the book of Proverbs and all the stuff says about parenting that says volume increases persuasiveness. But that's what we think. Now, just sometimes we need to raise our voices. Yeah, if Johnny's running toward the street and there's a car coming and you're 50 yards away, you better raise your voice and stop him from running into the street. The heart of the wise teaches his mouth and adds persuasiveness to his lips. The heart of the righteous ponders how to answer. You know what ponder means? You think about it. You chew on that for a little bit. The heart of the righteous ponders how to answer. You may need to take five before you correct your child to calm down and get some control and to ponder how to answer because death and life are in the power of the tongue. And how we speak to them will sometimes provoke them to anger. Thirdly, we must practice what we preach and avoid double standards. This should be obvious. Isn't this required in Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9? The words which I'm commanding you shall be on your heart and you shall teach them. Our children will quickly become frustrated with a lifestyle that is forced upon them and not lived before them. This has nothing to do with things that are appropriate for adults and not appropriate for children. It has everything to do with their seeing in us the same godliness and character that we ask of them. Number four, make sure your children know what you expect of them, what the rules are, and that both mom and dad enforce them consistently. Unity is critical if our children are not to be exasperated. A laid-back dad and a driven mom, or a driven dad and a laid-back mom, who have not agreed on how they're enforced, the rules in their home are a surefire recipe for, for frustrated kids. You've got to be on the same page. The rules must be clear and consistent. We can't change them one day to the next. That requires some work, mom and dad, on your part, okay? You can't tell your four-year-old and your 16-year-old to do the same thing, clean your room, and expect the same results. What's your four-year-old's room going to look like if you say, clean your room? What's your 16 year Okay, that could be a bad illustration. <laughs> but you get the point? you got to be way more detailed with your four-year-old than with your 16-year-old, assuming that you've trained your 16-year-old from the time they were three or four to put the shoes away and clean up the closet and straighten this and fix that and put the books back on the shelf and yada, 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 so that when you say to your 16-year-old, go clean your room, they got it. They got the drill. Your four-year-old's not there yet. Okay, that's going to take some work on your part as parents to make sure your children know what you expect of them, what the rules are, and that both mom and dad enforce them consistently. So mom and dad, you've got to have some sit-down talks about what you're going to expect and how it's going to be enforced. Number five, work at being positive with your children. What's our default setting so often? No. Isn't it? No is easy. No. We're going to be positive with the kids. We say plenty of no's, and we need to say no often. But if that's all they ever hear from us, no happy words, no affirmations of love, no expression of delight, few moments of pleasure, we drastically increase the likelihood of their exasperation. So plan happy times with your children in such a way that there'll be little you have to say no to. Do that. Doesn't God schedule pleasant, happy times for us over and over and over and over and over again? He does. Plan happy times with your children. Be sure that your no's are necessary and not simply a convenience for you. Mama, Mama, may I go out and play in the new snow, please? And what comes to Mama's mind? Snowsuit, snow boots, wool socks, scarves, 
sock hats, 10 minutes, and they're back in and dripping all over the floor. No. Yes. Yes. Go play in the snow. And mom, you suck it up to do whatever you need to do to give a little bit of, a few moments of pleasure to your child. Because if no is all they hear, or the majority of what they hear, you know what we're doing? Provoking them to anger. Make sure they know that you love them. Assure them of your unconditional love. Oh, they know I love them. How many times have you said that to them in the last week? How many times have they sat on your lap and just snuggled? Okay, not you guys. Well, I maybe so. I don't know. It's so critical of our children that they that they understand and they feel and they sense and they hear that we love them unconditionally. Do they know that when they've blown it? When they've blown it big time. They've really, they, they lost their temper. They did the worst thing you could ever imagine. Do they still know in that moment that you love them? Without question. This is so critical for our children. I'm, I'm going to say it's especially so for fathers and daughters. If they don't get that love and affection from you, they'll find it in places they shouldn't be looking. Allow your children to fail without branding them as failures. How is God with you when you fail? Isn't he good when you fail all the time? So what do your children feel from you when they've blown it? Whether they've accidentally broken the vase or the window or whether they lost the ball game and they dropped the fly ball that sent in the winning run or whether they've sinned against you, or whether they violated the cardinal rule in your household that you never violate, what do they sense from you? Even if their action calls for discipline, do they sense that you still unconditionally love and accept them even while you're handing out the punishment? Do they sense that? We're back to the big overall atmosphere of parenting again, aren't we? Do they understand, do they know that home is the safe place, the secure place where your children can fall and be picked up instead of kicked. They've got to know that. Or we provoke them to anger. Be accessible and approachable to your children. Make it easy for your children to get to you and to get your ear. Remember how accessible Jesus was to sinners and even to children. Is there one record in this book of somebody who couldn't get to Jesus? Anywhere? No. No, he was always accessible. We must be accessible. We've got to make it easy for our children to get to us and to get our ear. If they hear too many, if our kids hear too many, not now, later, I don't have time, can't you see daddy's busy? They'll be delighted when some predator always has time to listen to them on the internet. Granted, especially when they're false, so many things they're just dying to tell you are trivial. Grandpa, Grandpa, that's what I am, okay? Grandpa, 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 guess what? What? The snow is melting. <laughs> yeah, that's what it does. Grandpa, Grandpa, Grandpa the snow is melting. You're right. Look, it is. And look at the little rivers that are coming down the sidewalk from all that melting snow. And watch it. Watch it dripping off the trees. Isn't it cool the way the snow melts? If our kids can't get to us with trivial things, will they ever come to us with what's really important? 
We've got to be accessible to our children so that when they have something really critical, they'll come because we've not shut them down too many times. Please don't compare your children to other children, not even to the brothers or sisters. Why can't you be like so-and-so? Because you got one kid that's a neat freak, and you got another kid who is pig pen. Why can't you be like your brother? Because God, some kid ought to answer back if they could do it with respect. Because God didn't make me that way, okay? God didn't make me that way. Don't be partial. Don't compare your children. Don't be partial to one over another, and that's way more easier to do than you think. Because you got one who's just like you, and you got one who you wonder, did this kid come from me? It's easy to be partial. Please don't. You'll provoke them to wrath. Pick you about us carefully. Not every, bre- not every beach is worth dying on. If we elevate every issue to the level of moral ground, we will exasperate our children very quickly. Okay, I, I'm going to stir the controversial pot here. We may not like the new jeans that look like they're ready for the rag bag, and you pay money for those. Okay, that blows my mind, all right? Just saying. Who said that? (laughs) Do you have children? Do they wear ragged jeans? (laughs) We may not like the new jeans, the rag bag jeans. We may not like pierced ears. We may not like highlighted hair. We may not prefer posters on the walls of the room. They may like a genre of music that we don't care for, but if we're ready to spill blood on every one of those kinds of beaches, we're going to exasperate our children very quickly. And this doesn't mean that they make all the rules and call all the shots. I'm just saying, evaluate very carefully how many beaches you're ready to die on and spill blood over. Because if everything becomes a beach to die on, we will exasperate our children very quickly. Keep your word. Isn't this obvious stuff? You guys could come up with this list. Keep your word to your children. Let your yes be yes. Unless you're unmistakably providentially hindered, keep your word to your children. If you said you'd be there, be there. If you said you're going to go, go. Why should they trust you when you give them the gospel if they can't trust you to show up at their party or ball game or play when you said you would? Keep your word. Keep your word to your children. When you're wrong, be willing and quick to admit it and to ask for forgiveness. Ask your children for forgiveness. Yes. Why? Because sometimes we sin against them. There aren't too many things more exasperating to a child than a proud parent who is never wrong. What they're seeing when we, when we confess our sins and ask forgiveness is the gospel at work in mom and dad. And that goes a long way toward bringing the gospel to our children. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. Do not exasperate your children so that they will not lose heart. What time will we quit? It's 11.46. Five or ten minutes? Fasten your seatbelts. <laughs> he said five or ten. You heard that, right? I'm going for ten. What they must do, bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Bring them up. The word means to nourish, provide for it, bring to maturity. It's what Christ does for the church in Ephesians 5.29. He sees to it that the church says everything she needs to come to maturity. This is what we're supposed to do with our children. Bring them up. We're not spectators. Bring them up. We're not spectators. 
to the process of our children growing up. We're to bring them up, take them by the hand, and lead them through the whole complex of life's events and decision experiences to be well-adjusted, responsible, mature adults who understand what life is about, why they're here, where they're going, what the point of it all is. Bring them up. Lead them. This is our clear and present duty. And if we do not take up this call from God, our children will be in a very clear and present danger. We have a wonderful illustration of this in what Joseph and Mary did with Jesus. Luke 4, 16. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. Anybody an English teacher in here? What's wrong with y'all? That verb is passive. Where he had been brought up. It means the subject was acted upon. It's not the subject doing the action. It's the subject acted upon. Where he had been brought up. It doesn't say where he grew up. Who brought him up? Mary and Joseph. That ought to shock us and not shock us all at the same time. It ought to shock us that the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, who is before all things, by whom all things hold together as part of his humiliation, subjected himself to an earthly pair of created, finite, limited, sinful human beings, but he did. That ought to shock us. And it ought not to shock us if we take that humiliation seriously and understand that his humanity, sinless though it was, was as real as yours and mine. He didn't come out of Mary's womb speaking fluent Aramaic. He came out gurgling. He didn't come out walking or able to eat solid food or potty train. He was a helpless baby who had to learn everything from scratch. And he didn't have angels for tutors. He had Joseph and Mary. That ought to blow our minds. If we take his humanity seriously and his deity seriously, where he was brought up, what did they do? Luke 2. He went down with them and came to Nazareth, and he continued his projection to them. This is the, this, this is the, la the, the years of his life from 12 to adulthood. About 18 years worth of life till his public ministry. He went out with them and came to Nazareth and he continued his rejection of them and his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. Wow. Mary and Joseph saw to his intellectual development he increased in wisdom. They saw to his education. They taught him. They set before him the fear of the Lord, just the beginning of wisdom. They saw to his physical and emotional development. He increased in stature. They guided him through the many changes that take place in a growing boy's body. They didn't stand back and watch it happen. They brought him up. That's what we're trying to understand. Do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up. Dads, we've got to bring our children up. We've got to see to their intellectual development, see to their physical and emotional development. They saw to the cultivation of his spiritual life long before Jesus got to the cross or got to Gethsemane and prayed, not my will but thine be done. Where did he learn that? Remember Mary's response to the angel when he told her she was going to be pregnant and she wasn't married? She said, Behold the bond slave of the Lord, be it done to me according to your word. Jesus saw, not my will but yours be done in his mother. He learned. He learned that from his mama. And they saw to the development of his social life. He increased in favor with men. We're going to talk about this in our session after lunch. They, talked, they, they saw to it that Jesus learned the necessary social graces of his day. So that in his public ministry, he was able to move about with ease among men of every sort and rank. He learned what it was to be a gentleman. They taught him manners. When people took offense to him, it was because of what he spoke, not because he was rude and unmannerly. This is what we must be doing bringing our children up, not watching them grow up, but bringing them up purposefully. How are we to bring them up in the discipline and instruction 
of the Lord. We talked about discipline yesterday. Instruction is what we put in their minds. This is why we need to be bringing Scripture into all of our discipline and training. You just got to do it, okay? And I got to stop. So bring them up, dads. Don't provoke them to anger. But, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. And that means you better know what the Lord says. You need to be living in the book of Proverbs if you're a young parent. You need to be saturating your minds with the Bible so it's almost like breathing to root our discipline and training in the Scriptures. Pay a lot of attention to the signpost from Proverbs book. And there's a website, Wise Words for Moms. It's put out by Shepherd Press. Get on your technology and look it up and download it so you got it right there at hand to root your discipline and instruction in the Word of God. What a high and holy calling it is to be a parent. What a joy it is to see our children come to know the Lord. And may that be the case. May that be the end point of all of our discipline and instruction that our children come to know the Lord. And if there are children or young people in this room this morning who are not Christians, and your mom and dad have worked with you, and they've set the gospel before you, pay attention to them. Listen to them. You desperately need Jesus to be your Savior. You will never make it on your own. You need the gospel. Run to Jesus. You'll make your mom and dad really happy. But more than that, you'll secure your eternity in heaven forever. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the unspeakable privilege of being parents. What a, what a journey it is to walk with our children through this world. We pray that you would help us to walk wisely, carefully, thoughtfully. May we set the best of examples for our kids. May we be diligent and faithful in disciplining and instructing them. May we, may we be everything to our children that they need. Help us to the end that our children will someday come to know and love and trust the Lord Jesus with all of their hearts. We give our children to you. And we ask for your help in Jesus' name. Amen. You'll turn to number 179 in your grace hymnal. Let us stand and sing together, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus, just the first and fourth verse.
then I'm going to ask Heather if you'd take Tim and Camille to the front of the line so you guys can eat and be ready to preach again at 1 o'clock. Um, I'm going to ask the blessing upon the food in just a minute that you guys can uh, go with her. Uh, what wonderful truths we've heard. I know some may uh, been a gut blow, uh, a little bit to work on or a lot to work on. Um, I promise you, as we just sang, you'll be glad if you did. Um, if you will trust God's word and follow it, uh, and it will prove to be true. Uh, there's no other way than his way. So uh, may we put these things into practice, relying upon him and his grace as we do so. Well, let us play, pray, and if you haven't joined, please, or if you hadn't planned on joining us for lunch, please do, uh, and stick around for the one o'clock service. Let's pray. Father, we give you praise. We thank you for what we've heard Father, we thank you for who you are as our Heavenly Father. Uh, Father, we thank you for sending your Son, and the access that we have to you through Christ. Father, may we, as uh, parents, uh, may we lead our children in such a way that they know that uh, a father's love, that they know what it is to be disciplined by a father who loves them, uh, a mother. And Father, that they would see the great need that they have, that each in this room, whether young or old, would see the great need that they have for their Heavenly Father and the salvation that Christ offers. Father, work in such a way among us. We ask that you bless the food now as we go and partake, that you would um, nourish our bodies, make us full so that we're ready to sit and listen again at 1 o'clock. Bless our fellowship. May our words be life to one another. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.